Hi everyone, I hope you're having a wonderful day. Well, today I wanted to invite you along for a fall gardening day. We have a lot to get done. I wanna get my snowdrops planted. I wanna get all my dahlias labeled so that they're ready to go into storage. I wanna cut back all my peony foliage to prevent botrytis. I already see a little bit of botrytis trying to creep in over here. I also have planted all the daffodils and scylla I want over in Grace's garden. So I wanna mulch that area up with some shredded leaves. So let's just go ahead and grab all our tools and get right to work. So I wanna start off by labeling all my dahlias. I like to just use flagging tape and then write the variety name on here and I'll tie it to the very base of the plant. That way, once the first frost does hit, it actually didn't hit the other day like I thought. These plants will all just turn brown and it'll be hard to tell which one's which. So I like to flag them all before that happens. But the really great thing is, is that this is a variety that we grew from Sia together and I absolutely love it. I love the structure of the plant. The height is just perfect for me. Beautiful pink color with that lemon center. The bees and butterflies absolutely adore this dahlia. So not only do I wanna save the tuber and perpetuate this variety via the tuber, but I also wanna save seed from this dahlia. And when you save seed from a dahlia that's been cross-pollinated, you haven't been isolating each bloom, you're gonna get who knows what. So we're not going to get this dahlia by saving the seed from this dahlia. We'll get something totally different, but it'll be fun and interesting to see what appears. So since we grew this dahlia from seed, we can name it ourselves. And I was looking through my dahlia handbook here from the American Dahlia Society. And surprisingly, there's a lot of dahlias that have grace in the name. Oh, hi, Rocky. They have sweet grace, they have cultivate grace, but no one has saving grace. So I wanna call this Dahlia Saving Grace. And so I'll just write that here on my flagging tape. Don't mind my terrible handwriting. And then I just try to take a strip, maybe about 18, 20 inches long and I'm just gonna tie it around the base of one of these stems. So now that we have that done at this point, I'm not gonna deadhead any more of this dahlia. I'm gonna let it go to seed. So here's the seed pod forming. Here's a seed pod that looks pretty good and brown, and I'm gonna go ahead and harvest these and dry them out now. So here's some that we're gonna go ahead and take inside. At this point, some people will take the seed out right now. What I have had the best success with in my environment is to let the seed heads dry out for a month and then go ahead and remove the seed. Here's one that I wouldn't wanna collect. I'm just gonna throw this right back into the garden. You can see there, it has a little bit of mold on it. So I don't wanna bring that one inside and dry it out. Also, I would highly recommend this book, Dahlia Breeding for the Farmer, Florist, and the Home Gardener. This is by the owner of Santa Cruz Dahlias, and it talks all about hybridizing dahlias, saving dahlia seeds. So if it's something that interests you, I would really recommend this book. Um, I can't remember how much it costs. I think it was less than $20. It's definitely a book that I enjoy having rather than just getting from the library because it's really a resource book. She dries out the seeds just a little bit different than I do, but once again, I think that's more of an environmental difference. And the method that I use is the method that Swan Island Dahlias recommends. So let's go inside and get these on a paper plate and disassemble them. So we're just here in my addition now where I do all my seed starting. I just have a table set over my sink. And what I like to do is just get these paper plates, label them with a variety. This is an open pollinated variety. And then I just would normally stick them here for about a month to dry out. But like I said, I'll go ahead and kind of take one apart for you in case you live in an environment where maybe you want to take the seed out right away and let the seed dry out on its own. Hopefully you can kind of see here, I'm trying to hold real still. The seed is kind of held there in the center. So here's where the center of the dahlia was. Here's the petal. So it's kind of attached there at the center. And then, let's see if we can stay in focus. If I would just peel that back, that's the seed right there. And there's the seed right there. Here's some seed all on its own. And what I've always heard and seen myself by collecting the seed is that the single dahlias and also the collarette dahlias 
provide you with a lot more seed. Also, open pollinated provides you with a lot more seed than if you were just hand pollinating and trying to create a new variety. But definitely, I'm really no expert in this field of saving dahlia seed. I've done it a couple of times with success, but I would really recommend Christine's book to really get more of a broad education and really her expertise is something that I lean heavily into. And she's really forthcoming with information, both successes and failures. So with the dahlia seed underway, let's go ahead and finish tagging my big dahlias that I grew from tubers. So back here in this bed, we have three Myrtle's Folly, two Sweet Love, one Labyrinth, one Melina Fleur, one Creme de Cognac, and then some more Melina Fleur over here. I mainly want to tag the ones back here today because I think I'll be able to remember what's in the border. But these ones, as they get all jumbled up and turn brown, they all look exactly the same. I see we have a tarnished plant bug on Myrtle's Folly, so I wanted to give you a close up on this bug if you're new to it. This is a bug that I had struggled with right from the beginning. It has a piercing sucking mouth part, and so it deforms your flower a lot of times when it's in the bud stage. And when I was first starting growing cut flowers and selling them, I had no idea why I was having these deformed zinnias and deformed dahlias, and it's because of this bug right here. So here's what Myrtle's Folly should look like, but here's what it looks like if a tarnished plant bug starts to feed on it. You can see that it's really deformed and the top petals are basically just missing. And the very first row, sorry, and the very first year that I grew cut flowers, I was growing in rows, the rows were right here, a lot of them, and these rows were zinnia and cosmo rows. My zinnias were coming on, they were looking great, they were butted up, they were looking great. All of a sudden they start to open, and about half of them look like this, or the bud would abort, there would be a tip dieback, there would be a necrosis. All of these crazy, terrible things were happening, and I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't find any information in my books, and then thankfully, I saw in some group that I was in, someone was talking about the tarnished plant bug. So just something to be aware of, and if you've never seen tarnished plant bug before, I just wanted to make sure and show you that. And so the way that I like to control any and basically all pests on the dahlias, with probably the exception of earwigs, is just to bag the blooms when they're in the bloom stage with organza bags. That really does the trick. So I'm basically just preventing the bugs from eating the blooms. For earwigs, what I like to do is, I'll put a link to this in the description also, is soy sauce and olive oil traps, and I just bury those in the soil surface, and then they kind of go into that trap at night and drown there in the soy sauce and olive oil. That's worked really good for me. So I have a video on how I like to store my dahlia tubers. I like to store them in clumps, and I like to store them dirty, meaning that I leave some of the soil on the tuber clumps. And then I prefer to divide them in the spring. I've also stored them in plastic wrap. For that, you do need to divide them first into individual tubers. That worked really great. I just thought it was a little bit time consuming for what I need personally. So friends, we got our dahlia seeds drying in the addition. We've got our tubers marked and ready for storage when the time comes. I wanted to show you that the cocoa gold marigolds are just starting to come on now. And there's now no frost in sight for the next 10 days. The lowest night I see is 42. So my intention is to set up the flower stand again this coming weekend, which will be the first weekend in November. That's probably the latest I've ever been able to set up the flower stand. And we'll do marigolds. We'll do Cornell Dahlia in the front is looking really good. I have some foxglove. We have the celosia and the Mexican bush sage we can put into it. And then I think what I'm also going to do is just sell bunches of foliage and bunches of grass. Just try that out and see how it goes. I have all that mahogany splendor hibiscus 
and I'm just gonna bunch it up into really big bunches and see if it sells. And then the other day I was at Terrain and I was looking at their dried flowers and they were selling, it was like five stems of straw flower for $28 and then this really small bunch of miscanthus for $28. So I have a lot of miscanthus, so I thought I would just give that a try too. And we'll just see what happens. And I also have my final wave of sunflowers back here. So these are also Sunflower Steve's Van Gogh Fantasy Mix. Aren't they beautiful? So now let's go ahead and grab Grace. I'm gonna mulch up her garden with kind of a double shred of the oak leaves. We have a pin oak right here. The leaves take a while to break down, but I've always used them over in her garden and it's been really great over there. So let's do that next. Grace, you wanna go mulch your garden? You wanna go outside? And what I mean by double mulch is, I'm just gonna run over them twice to break them down a little bit more. So in Grace's garden this year, I added about 100 Mount Hood daffodils. I also added in a lot of grape hyacinths, some blue grape hyacinths, some scylla, all kinds of fun stuff. But I wanted it to kind of be blue, whites, and buttery yellows over here in the spring. I thought that would be really beautiful. Hi Grace, what you doing there? You gonna help mulch your flowers? I got Grace's garden all mulched up. She did help me out a bit and I'm ready to move on and go ahead and cut back some of my peonies now. Generally, I leave most of my garden up just as you see it over the winter. I don't really pull things out or cut things back just so that all of my native bugs and pollinators can have somewhere to live over the winter. However, there are a few plants which I always cut back in the fall. Number one are peonies because of botrytis, which is a fungal disease. Also, we have powdery mildew in our area. And for me, it's just better to go ahead and clean up the foliage and actually dispose of it. I won't put these in the compost pile. So I'm gonna just leave just a little bit of stem because I wanna come in here with some tulip bulbs and I wanna know not to disturb these roots. Well, friends, we're making really great progress today. So now what I wanna do is just plant some snowdrops right here. Oh, there's Grace, right here under the bench. I thought that would really be kind of sweet to have some of those small white blooms peeking up in early winter, but I need to show you a re-blooming iris over here in the driveway garden called October Splendor. Here it is, isn't that beautiful? A wonderful peach color. I'm so excited to have some re-blooming iris in the garden this year. So I just dug out a trench about three inches deep. I have 50 snowdrops here, and I'm gonna put them about three inches apart from each other. I've always heard that snowdrops are one of the bulbs that you wanna get in the ground as soon as you get them. 
because they have a tendency to dry out. So whenever I get my order, I try to plant these as soon as possible. Whenever I listen to British gardeners, they talk about planting snowdrops in the green, but I have never seen that available here in Southern PA or in Western PA where I used to live. Just get these all covered up here. And hopefully that'll be really beautiful come spring. One other thing I've noticed with planting snowdrop bulbs is that there have been some years I've planted the bulbs and the following spring I only get foliage and then it takes an additional year for them to flower. I have read that that is kind of a common occurrence. So let me know if that's been your experience with snowdrop bulbs specifically, but definitely by year two, they're always flowering, super beautiful, and these bulbs are super inexpensive. Well, friends, I think that's gonna bring me to the end of today's video. I have a lot more minor bulbs to get into the ground, some more scylla, some crocus I'm gonna be planting over in the lawn, and also another round of grape hyacinths. But for now, I wanna wish you all a wonderful day out there in your gardens, and I'll see you sometime soon. Bye.